Hello, everybody. My name is Zenko Lieber. I work with uh, Stackable and together with Lars Franke, I'm here today to give you a brief insight into what our vision for the future is for Stackable. Yeah, thank you, Zönke. And yeah, my name is Lars uh, Lars Franke, and as Zönke mentioned, I'm also working at Stackable. And yeah, we're talking about um, a new kind of big data distribution, as as Zönke already mentioned. Uh, obviously, I don't know any of your backgrounds, and I don't know anyone who's who's listening. So I'll give a super quick introduction. Uh, what 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 we mean by big data distribution, and and uh, yeah, what we're talking about. So. The whole big data ecosystem started around 2006, 2008 with the Apache Hadoop ecosystem. I, I assume that some of you or most of you uh, already know tools like Apache Kafka, Apache Spark, Apache NiFi, Apache HBase, and so on. And there's, there's lots of tools out there in this big data space. Like if you want to process, store, uh, visualize lots lots of data with open source tools, you have to use more than, more than one tool, often uh, tens or so. So what, what, what happened is uh, around 2008, the first distributions happened. So these are companies, and uh, these companies started building distributions. Basically, they packaged the software, or all the, um, all, all the open source tools, they packaged them together, made it easy to manage, made it easy to deploy, upgrade, and, and sell your support. Um, the, these numbers might be off a bit. It's not super easy to find find the find the exact years, but as you can see, uh, like back in 2008 or the, the 2011 and so on, there were four or five different companies offering these kind of uh, distributions. Um, you can see that Intel dropped off fairly early. They invested in Cloudera instead. Uh, later, IBM dropped off and Pivotal dropped off. They uh, merged or migrated to Hortonworks. So these are all companies. That, that did offer or still offer um, commercial distributions around, around the Hadoop ecosystem. Now, as you can see, since 2019, there's only single distribution left. So there's only uh, the Cloudera and they have their, their own distribution. And that's the only um, commercial distribution left for uh, like on-premise big data stuff um, out there. There is an obvious competition, and that that are all the cloud vendors. Like you can obviously go to Amazon and uh, Google and Microsoft and and buy these things um, uh, in, in the cloud, but you can't get it you can't get it uh, on for on premise in one package other than Cloudera. So Cloudera and Hortonworks merged in 2019, and <laughs> what happened then is is this. This is not to scale; it's just illustrative, and. Um, the pricing for these distributions usually was like per node. Like if you had one node, you paid this amount of money. If you had two nodes, uh, you paid this amount of money and so on. And the prices remained relatively stable for most of the of the time. But when only a single company was left, the prices skyrocketed from, I think, $2,000 per node per year to uh, 10000 uh, per per node per year, obviously before discounts and so on. But anyway. Um, and both Cloudera and Hortonworks actually did provide a free version of their distribution up until 2019 or a bit later. But after the merger, the free version was removed and these pricing changes came uh, came into effect. And the fact is, for people using this stuff on premise or even in, in the cloud, obviously things have gotten much more much more expensive. Um, so this is where where we come in. Um, where, where we're building, what we're building. Uh, both Zunke and I already had like a small company, we we're open core, like a big data consulting company. And what happened in 2019 was that we got contacted by lots of our customers, and they asked, "What, what are the, what are your other customers doing now? Like we, we used to pay this amount, now we pay two, three, four, five times, or we used to use the free version, and now we have to uh, pay a lot of money all, all of a sudden. So, uh, what, what's everyone else doing now?" And what, what we did is we organized a meeting, or actually three or four. This was before Corona and it was in person. And um, yeah, we, we organized a couple of meetings with like uh, 40 different uh, uh, companies and, and in Germany. And everyone was unhappy with the situation. And so we decided to found Stackable in 2020. And um, yeah, we, we are basi basically building now a big data distribution. But um, yeah, that's that's... That's our super quick history. Uh, the distribution that we're building is open source, and um, the things, yeah, we're we're building it on, and our yeah foundation pieces are 
what we're going to talk about now. And with that, I'll hand over to Zünke with what we actually do. Yes, thank you, Lars. So I have the same problem as Lars. I don't know who's watching or what your background is. So I'll, I'll start off with a very, very brief introduction into Kubernetes. And I'll, I'll keep it really brief, I promise, because most of you probably know more about it than me. Um, so when we started off, we took a good look at what we actually need to, to build a distribution of big data tools. And um, it was fairly obvious that we would need something to sort of act as the central instance to a whole state, but also something to decentrally manage the servers that we want to roll out these products on. The, the old or existing distributions all have some form of, of management tool. So Cloudera, for example, has the Cloudera Manager, which has a web UI and you can click and add services and configure them. For Hortonworks, it was Ambari. And, Every distribution pretty much had something to, to manage and define your services in. And um, well, we took a good look around at what's out there. And Kubernetes currently is fairly hard to miss. It is um, one of the bigger projects in the uh, pretty much any space currently. So um, we, we did take a good look, hard look at Kubernetes. And um, we've, we've just pulled out a few of the basic principles of Kubernetes here to give a brief introduction. So um, it's, a, it's an orchestration framework to manage services. Um, which is a fairly uh, abstract th thing to say. Um, it is declarative by nature. So you don't tell Kubernetes, please do this, please do that, please do this. But you simply tell it, I would like my world to look like this. Go and make that happen. So basically, in, in our world, you would tell Kubernetes, I'd like a Kafka cluster, please, on all nodes that match this descriptor. And then you trust Kubernetes to go and figure out what needs to happen to do that. And to support that, Kubernetes offers a few basic data types. So Kubernetes has a few built-in data types, things like um, ports, which describe a workload to be executed, nodes, which describe pretty much a server that's out there that's ready to run a workload, and lots and lots of other things around that, like deployments and stateful sets, and there's the secrets to store passwords and things like that. So Kubernetes offers lots of abstractions. But and that's where, where it becomes really interesting. Kubernetes also offers something called custom resource descriptions, which allows you to extend Kubernetes to help you with what you exactly want to achieve. So for us, for example, that's obviously, we need to come up with a custom resource description uh, to describe how an HDFS cluster should look like, or a Kafka cluster, or going a bit more abstract, for, for example, a Kafka topic, or ACLs on a Kafka topic. And then those, those resources can, can relate to each other. So for example, you could define a Kafka topic and an ACL that relates to that topic and then deploy that to separate clusters. So uh, it's a very fairly flexible data model that you can build on top of Kubernetes. And uh, I was listening to a podcast recently which said, where someone said Kubernetes is less, a, less of a deployment technology or something, but it's a platform to build platforms, which sounds a bit cheesy if we're honest, but it is actually not too far from the truth. Because um, using these abstraction layers, you can actually just use the Kubernetes control plane to create platforms of your own. And um, I actually had to look up the description of platform and it, what I found was uh, it's a layer of technology that makes software delivery possible, which is pretty much exactly what we are trying to achieve. So uh, that, that fits the bill fairly well for us. So if you take a look from very high up at Kubernetes, um, what Kubernetes is, is at the center of it is the API server. That's the central instance that you always interact with. And you as the user on the left, you simply declare what you want your world to look like and give that to the API server. And the API server then uh, persists that into etcd. And etcd here, it's a storage technology for, for all intents and purposes. Um, could also be a relational database or pretty much anything else. Um, it is something a bit specialized for Kubernetes, but it is more of an implementation detail that we don't really need to talk about too much. And what the API server then does is it informs everybody who's interested about what just changed. And it doesn't really tell them what exactly changed, it just tells them what the new state is. So the cluster is now, I don't know, if, if I change my cluster from three to five nodes, it would simply tell everybody who's interested, this cluster now should have five nodes. But it won't tell them that it used to have three nodes. So the 
the sort of general principle in Kubernetes is always that you shouldn't know what has changed. You should only need to know how does it look like now. And that's the only input that your basically control plane should need. And what the control plane then does is it triggers a so-called reconciliation, which means it, it tries to reconcile what is with what should be. And then that reconciliation probably triggers stuff that gets written back to the API server again, which gets persisted in etcd, and then it just goes back and forth for a while probably, because those changes will be noti will notify the control plane again, and that'll trigger changes again. And so that, that reconciliation can happen quite a few times until it's actually done. And at some point in time, something will fall out of that that actually needs executing to make something happen. And that will usually be a pod that is assigned to a kubelet. And the kubelets then are the, the decentralized things that run on servers to actually execute your workload in a container. And I know everybody who knows anything about Kubernetes will probably uh, be aghast at this slide and, and how simple this makes it look. But um, drilling, going, going very, very, very far back, this is at least to me, the, the underlying principle of what Kubernetes is about. So after having taken a look at Kubernetes, of course, we needed to define our relationship with Kubernetes. So um, our first sort of um, goal or, or mission that we came up with, and we pitched this to, to the customers that last, last mentioned in the workshop was, all right, we'll just write a couple of operators to roll out these 10, 12, 15, 20, how many ever there are of these big data products, deploy them to an existing Kubernetes cluster, and then everybody can be happy because we had the least amount of effort because Kubernetes takes a lot of, lot of work off our hands. And you have your data, big data tools running in a Kubernetes cluster. But um, most of our customers actually were not too keen on that because, um, and a lot of what I'm now saying might be prejudice, but there's, as you realize, there's probably a little bit of a kernel of a truth in there as well. Kubernetes is a fairly complex piece of software. Deploying Kubernetes, there's, there's a reason why there's many Kubernetes distributions and no one deploys it by hand anymore. So uh, it's got a lot of moving parts and, and things that have grown over time, have changed over time. Even people who, who work with the community and have been around from the start still say it's tough to keep up. And on top of that, Kubernetes always, also ha always has the sort of people always think that um, it, it costs performance. And some of our customers actually ran a few tests. And in, in their scenario, the overlay network actually cost them lots of performance. It might have improved since then, but results like that stick with you, I think. So our solution to that was, well, We'll just use parts of Kubernetes. We'll use the control plane, which gives us the back end that we need to orchestrate all our stuff. But to, to run the workloads, maybe we can simplify that a little bit and not use containers because taking containers out of the equation uh, makes uh, the, the performance problem, if I want to call it that, go away. And it also allows you to, to reuse your existing ops know-how because you can actually SSH into the machine. You can log it. Uh, you can tailor log file, you can use VI to in inspect the config file, stuff like that. So it's um, it gives you everything that your ops people might be used to. But on the other hand, it also gives you the option to use existing Kubernetes tools and know-how because Kubernetes does give you, in theory, the chance to orchestrate and, and control and manage your entire stack from one place, which is the Kubernetes API server. And by sticking very close to Kubernetes standards, we make that possible to, with, with our tools as well. And we'll actually have a demo later on where, uh, where I'll show how we deploy our workloads on bare metal. And I do realize that bare metal is probably a bit of a loaded term in this in this context, but we've somehow, somehow grown used to it, so we keep using it. Um, and looking a bit into the future, what this also makes possible is hybrid architectures. Because for, for some of our tools, for example, if we take HDFS as an example, HDFS runs two types of nodes. It runs data nodes and it runs name nodes. And data nodes are very, very state heavy. They have terabytes of data that they, that they manage ideally locally. And if one of these data nodes fails, you wouldn't really want Kubernetes to spin that up three machines over in a different data center on a different rack and then having to move all that data over there as well. Plus, HDFS has redundancy built in. So if that node fails, 
it doesn't really matter because HDFS has been built to accommodate that and simply keeps trucking along. The name nodes in HDFS, on the other hand, those don't have too much state. They simply have metadata in memory that says, well, that file's there, that file's there, he's in charge of that. If those die, it may very much make sense to spin them up somewhere else because they can recover this, their state fairly easily. And um, so that's having these hybrid architectures sort of allows us to do Kubernetes where it makes sense, just not everywhere. And that's a very good thing. So if we come back to the picture that I showed earlier from uh, Kubernetes from orbit, I think it was called, or from outer space, um, where do we fit in here? So this is the unchanged picture. And what we did was we wrote a couple of operators, which should hopefully now be uh, exactly. Um, up top, it was the sort of unchanged original idea. We just write a couple of operators that write stuff out to Kubernetes and manage these tools. And I'll leave those to last. You'll say lots about them later on. But what we also did was we wrote a, a replacement for the Kubernetes kubelet, which is called the stackable agent at the moment. We suck at naming things. If anybody has a good idea what this should be called based on what it does, and you'll learn what it does in the next five minutes, please let us know because we, we can't come up with anything better. And what the stackable agent does is it gets pods assigned just like the kubelet, but then it goes and downloads not a container image, but actually a tar GZ file, which currently is the, the official Apache convenience binaries that are released and downloads those, extracts them, and then it creates a systemd service that runs off those binaries and with config files that it actually creates on disk. So if you want to have a look at how your service is doing, you can actually SSH into the machine, look at a config file, the, the one that is actually running currently, not one that's hidden away in a container somewhere and you need to understand the init script that created it. And um, also have a look at the logs. So that sort of gives you both, both worlds in, at the same time. And then if we <clears throat> move on, um, of course, that you could say that this is the worst of both worlds. We have the complexity of Kubernetes, but we don't have the flexibility of containers. And to that, I would say yes and no, because Kubernetes, as I said, if you take a look at the very core of it, it's a very simple thing. The API server is pretty much boils down to a REST web service that stores data and informs you if it changes. That's, that's not a terribly complex thing. The complexity comes when you take a look at the control plane, which has tens or even hundreds of controllers or operators and has this, this complex web of objects that de are dependent on each other and trigger changes everywhere else. But if you, do, if you take that away, the very core is pretty simply a very, very simple data model. So what we said is that we'd explicitly limit ourselves to a very, very small subset of the, of the data model of Kubernetes. So we'll, we're using a pod, because that's pretty much no way get, getting around a pod. We're using a node, because that's what you need to register as. So the agent registered itself as a node. We're using a couple of config maps, because that's where we generate config files from and secrets. Um, but all of those are fairly fairly simple and, and low level abstractions. So we're explicitly not using things like deployments or stateful sets or, or daemon sets or things like that because that's that's where complexity starts creeping in. Um, and we actually sp spoke to a team that develops uh, an, uh, a well known operator, and they said, "Yes, we are using deployments and stateful sets, and we wish we hadn't taken that decision early on because what that does is it gives you quick benefits." But once you move past that and you become, you start looking at more complex uh, workflows, then it also puts you in a, into the corset of doing stuff exactly the way that Kubernetes wants you to do stuff. And sometimes it can actually be very, yeah, it, it can be good to not use them because it gives you more freedom to do things exactly the way that you want to do them. Um, taking this even uh, even a step further, we could actually use something like um, KCP, which is, um, I think it's called the Minimal Kubernetes API Server. It speaks the same API as the Kubernetes API Server, but it doesn't know any of the objects that the, the Kubernetes API Server knows. So it doesn't know about a pod, it doesn't know about nodes. You'd need to create all of those as custom resources. And that, that would actually allow you to 
really, really stay very minimal in what you do. And um, Kubernetes itself is actually thinking about, I'm not sure if they're actually, actually considering moving into that direction, but there's been talk about if they'd be doing it again, they would implement everything as a CRD. Pretty much namespaces and, and maybe labels would be uh, built in objects, but the, the tendency towards simply doing everything as a CRD and not having anything pre-built and treated in a special way is something that Kubernetes, uh, the Kubernetes community is talking about as well. And by doing that and limiting us to this, this very, very small subset of things and doing a lot of things ourselves, which yes, that created a bit of overhead in the beginning, but it also gives us lots of freedom to implement things exactly the way we want them in our operators. And for those operators, I'll hand back over to Lars and he'll give you a brief overview of what we are doing there. Yep. Thank you, Zönke. Um, yeah, so what we do at Azteca, as Zönke mentioned, is we basically write a whole bunch of operators. And as Zönke also mentioned, these operators are basically pieces of software that control other pieces of software. So um, that's, this is what, what it looks like at the pseudocode level. Um, because what, what we are doing is basically we extract the, the knowledge that that you, like sysadmins, ops people, DevOps people, human operators have. And we try to extract all of that knowledge into, into one piece of software. And this piece of software is then responsible for managing a single thing. Like uh, we have a Kafka operator, we have a Kafka topic operator, we have a Kafka whatever operator. So all of these extract, extract the knowledge um, from humans so you don't need to do these repetitive tasks over and over. So uh, an operator basically, as Zynka also explained already, watches the resource. So we've got a Kafka operator and that watches the API server for Kafka cluster objects. Uh, that you as an end user store on the system. And then the operator takes over and it updates and or creates uh, like pods, config maps, and so on. So what it does, it, it translates these high level concepts like in cl cluster into pods, config maps, w whatever. So when we started uh, on this journey, we wanted to know like, how do other people do this? Like what are best practices? And there are some blog posts out there. There's some documentation. Google has a best practice page. Red Hat has one. And this talk is a bit too short to go into all the details. And you'll find them out there. Uh, what we found is that in, in reality, in our experience, they all of these guides fall a bit short. Like they stop where it gets interesting most of the time. And so what, what we found is that most people write a single operator or maybe maybe two, like for one or two projects, and, and that's it. So there's very little or uh, there's little code reuse. There is some, but not not a lot. And um our problem is that we have to write, well, problem, we like it, but our problem is that we have to write dozens of operators and they should all be and feel consistent to the end user. So what we found when looking at uh, existing operators is that all of them do things slightly, slightly, slightly different. So all of these operators uh, consist of a reconcile loop and I'll go into that uh, in, the next, in the next slide. And then, and what, what we like to do and what doesn't happen in, in the broader ecosystem is uh, we want to have common labels for everything. So everything should be common, uh, have, have common labels for pods, uh, objects, and whatever. We want to have common nomenclature that like a, a role or config or whatever, it's called the same in all our operators. Um, common status and events. Uh, they should they should feel similar because they will plug into your into your monitoring. Um, the configuration and the CRDs should feel the same. They should feel similar. Monitoring, tracing, metrics, all of that stuff should be the same. So it, whether you manage a NiFi cluster or a Kafka cluster, that shouldn't shouldn't really matter. Um, these things should have the same names and so on. Uh, so basically, common stuff. Um, like across the operators makes it easier and less surprising for the humans using the system. And as I also mentioned, we also have common hacks because what we found is yes, declarative is nice, but um, in reality, sometimes you do just need to restart this one stupid server over there. And uh, Kubernetes makes that pretty hard. And we there, there's other people out there who've uh, invented workarounds for like, please start the Postgres backup. Uh, like this is a this is like a command. That's hard to do in a declarative way or like a restart. Like declarative, this would, I mean, my goal state is started, uh, but just from started to started, I want to restart. 
And so we, we, we worked around these things. And our distribution should feel consistent, so we decided to write our own framework around these things. Um, okay, the reconcile loop. This is uh, something I, lo I looked at over 20 different operators in, in three different programming languages, and I found that there are two alternative styles to write this reconcile loop. One is the one on the right with huge steps. Like reconcile is called something changed. My Kafka cluster object changed. Now I'm going to do whatever work I need to do. Reconcile pod one, and I wait until it's uh, stored and up and running, then reconcile pod two, wait until it's up and running. This is good. Um, and it means that at the end of this loop, I basically have, um, I, I don't know exactly what the state is. Like the, the, my target state will be the desired state. And that's it. Right? Because nothing can interfere. I'll just do start at the beginning and end and at the uh, end. But if you have like a 300, 400 node cluster, these things can take time, like restarts or these kind of things. So this can take half an hour or so to run this one rec reconcile loop. And if you change your object in between, we won't notif uh, notice because we, we are not interrupting ourselves anywhere. So what we can do instead is have this left, uh, the small step um, approach where we do one thing and then check whether something changed and we need to requeue. This is um, uh, what's, uh, what, what's depicted here. So we reconcile pod one and then check has something changed. If, if yes, we requeue, which requeue basically means read my object from Kafka, uh, from from Kubernetes again, and then start over. So if something changes in between, we can immediately re react to changes. So we decided to go with this small steps approach. These names are crap, and we haven't come up with better ones. As Zunke had said, we, we have a huge naming problem. Um, but yeah, this is a, a, a style that we found in, in, in lots of operators. One, one, or, one or the other is used in almost all of them. So what we did is we have written a, an operator framework that's pretty like, Yes, there are some generic parts in there, but it's pretty tied to uh, to our company and our operators. It it can be reused, uh, but yeah, we haven't especially uh, uh, tried to make it reusable for people outside at, yet. Um, so what we what we added are like lots of convenience functions and structures. So it's like retrieve all existing pods, uh, all existing pods that match a label, retrieve and set conditions, make sure that the conditions transition, transition to the states that we want them, remove pods and so on. And often used higher level abstraction, things like remove all pods that are like orphaned, that we don't need anymore. Find nodes that, that should have a pod that, that don't, uh, th these kind of things. This requires a few conventions about uh, like what our objects should look like. But as I mentioned before, this is exactly what we want because we want consistency across all our operators. So um, if you know how to use uh, Kafka, you will also know how to use the NiFi operator. So how does it look uh, or work in real life? This is uh, almost real code. Like we, I just removed a tiny bit of boilerplate in between, but basically, we have these these two things, or these uh, the the yeah. We can basically chain these commands. Everything in blue comes from our framework, for example. So we can basically um, create our own chain the way that we want it. Red is something you need to implement yourself. At the moment, we're working on extracting more and more functionality. But here, for example, say init status, um, and then please delete all illegal pods that uh, don't match the required labels. Wait for terminating pods. If there are any pods still terminating. Uh, please just requeue and we'll we'll wait. Wait for running and ready pods. This is for things like a rolling restart. We want in a rolling restart scenario, we don't want to kick off like create new new servers, new new pods while there's still others uh, that are um, that are restarting. And then delete excess pods. Like you change the uh, the specification saying, I don't want any more uh, Kafka clusters, uh, Kafka brokers on that rack. So now they are excess. Delete them. And so we'll delete them. And next time, we'll, we'll probably end up in the wait for terminating pods uh, uh, state again and requeue, requeue, requeue until we're done. And this, um, like we're all the time extending this framework, basically adding more and more methods to this framework, which allows us to plug and play, uh, mix and match uh, these, these operators together. So we only have to implement the core business logic and don't have to implement all the stuff around it. And we found that uh, lacking. There are some some frameworks out there which do parts of it, but we haven't found anything that that does all of what what we need. 
And as Zunke also mentioned, we're using these lower level abstractions like pods and deployments and so on. That makes it a bit harder to use. But again, we are moving lots of these things uh, into, into our, our framework, which gives us the full flexibility while still being able to, uh, yeah, uh, easy to use. So I haven't talked about any programming languages, but for, for those of you who do know, they might have recognized that this is not Go, this is actually Rust. Um, so we decided to use Rust for all our operators. So that's the second uh, twist, basically. The first is that we're running Kubernetes and running this not with containers, but with the system D. And the second one is we decided to use Rust for all our operators and the agent as well. So Kubernetes and most third party operators are written in Go or Java. Why did we choose Rust? Well, <clears throat> when we started this whole thing, this was very much a community driven thing. Everything that we're doing is open source. As, as I mentioned, we should have put a link up somewhere. Um, we didn't know either language, so we, we didn't know Go, we didn't know Rust. Our background was Java. The whole uh, Apache big data ecosystem is Java, so our background was Java. So we tried both. We tried both languages, and we looked at the library ecosystem, and we liked Rust, and we liked it better. End of story. There's not much, like, there's not no hate for, for Go. It's just we liked Rust. We like the error handling, we like the enums, we like generics, no garbage collection, security. If it compiles, it'll probably work. And we're pretty happy with the decision. So some things like Go structural typing is pretty sweet. So it's not like, yeah, we don't, we don't hate Go. It's just we decided to go with Rust and we are pretty happy with it. So the Rust Kubernetes ecosystem, there, there are three crates is what we're using. Uh, K8S Open API is one. Uh, and that's um, if you want to build um, if you build things in Rust on top of uh, Kubernetes, this one you'll probably use because it generates uh, Rust structs and so on from the open RP spec for Kubernetes, which is super useful. Uh, they feel native to Rust, everything works, uh, works with generics and so on. So this is pretty, pretty good. The next one is KubeRS, and that's probably um, the most important one because this actually wraps the whole K8S open API stuff and puts a client around it. Like uh, this is, yeah, it gives, gives you, a, uh, as, as it says here, a more generic client uh, Go library because, yeah, uh, generics exist in Rust. I know they do in Go as well now, but um, it's, it's really, really easy to write generic things using KubeRS and it's fantastic. Uh, it's being developed all the time. The community is super responsive. Everyone's everyone's super nice. Things that we were missing have been added super fast. Uh, so if you want to build something in Rust on top of Kubernetes, this is the way to go. And the last one, and the last slide uh, for this presentation as well, is something called Crustlet. And this is uh, by the folks over at DS Labs, uh, which belongs to Microsoft. Um, and that's called Crustlet, as the name implies. It's a kubelet written in, in, in Rust. And they initially developed it to run WebAssembly stuff. So you can basically run WebAssembly stuff by assigning it pods as well. But it is generic, so it doesn't it doesn't matter. You can plug uh, plug in a different backend. So we plugged in this, our system D backend, and that works perfectly fine. They actually, as it says here, Crosslet 1.0 is coming soon. They actually, I think, in the process of donating this whole thing to the CNCF. Um, so this will become a more or less official project, hopefully soon. Uh, but I, I can't make any promises, I don't know. Yeah, so this is the quick summary um, of what we're doing. So we're doing a bit, a few things uh, special, but we are super happy with the choices we made. It's it's fun. We learned a lot. Um, Rust and Kubernetes have been treating us well. And with that, uh, I'll be handing over to Zunke because I think we're a bit short on time. But yeah, Zunke, please take it away. Yeah, that works. I can stretch or shorten the demo as necessary. So um, what you're looking at here is Pretty much just to set this up, um, this is our infrastructure that we'll be using to deploy things on. So we have um, an external network, which is connected to the internet with one edge node. And that also has a, a WireGuard VPN, which um, I'm logged into so that I can address all of the machines in the internal network, just as if, if I was in there as well. And then we have the, the orchestrator machine. So this is running K3S as a lightweight Kubernetes replacement. Well, actually, it is a lightweight Kubernetes. It's not a replacement. Um, so we'll be using that to, to as, as our control plane. And then we have worker one, two, and three, and main one. Those are the, the actual like proper machines that we want to manage and deploy services on. 
Um, if, if you want to play around with this, we, we do offer um, a, a we, we run a public REST service where you can download the Terraform and Ansible playbooks to stand this up. Um, just give us a shout after the demonstration and I'll, uh, I'll send you a link where you can download things to, to stand this up on your own and play around with it. It's um, uh, fairly fabulous, to be quite honest. Um, so, as I said, our agent will register in Kubernetes as a reg regular kubelet, more or less. So, um, these are the four machines that I just discussed. Uh, this is K9S, by the way. It's a, it's a command line interface to Kubernetes. Uh, you could also use Lens or Oculus, no, Octant, it's called, or pretty much. That, that's the that's fabulous thing. You can use whatever floats your boat and talks to Kubernetes. So, um, this one is... This is actually a regular Kubernetes kubelet, which has been deployed by K3S, so they, they coexist quite nicely. And then if you look in here, you can see we have a type crosslet, and then there's, there's a few taints in here, which are pretty much just there to make sure that we don't get any regular Kubernetes pods sent our way because our agent wouldn't know what to do with those. Those taints more or less uh, control that we only get the pods that our operators write out. And if I now want to deploy something, a, any of the big data services, um, what I would need to do is uh, head over here. So this is our also public. Is, this is the documentation repository, and we have the demo requests in here. So if you want to play around with those, please, by all means, go and check them out. And this is a Zookeeper cluster definition, what I was talking about earlier. It's, uh, at this point in time, it is fairly simple. We simply say we want one instance per, per server. Which, you know, we want one instance. Um, we want a Zookeeper in version 3.5.8. And please uh, deploy that on anything that matches this, which, as we just saw, should be worker 1, 2, and 3. And if I now apply this to the Kubernetes cluster, we should see down here, yep, that's been created. And I can now, over here, check out the, the, the object that we just created. And if we go all the way down, then you'll see in the status, we are tracking what's happening in the background. So this is currently doing an initial installation to version 3.5.8. So if we have a look at the pods over here, we can see two of them have already been written out and started. And the third one is in the pro process of being, being uh, started outside. And if we wait a little bit, yep, so now that's running as well. So what the, the agent has now done in the background is it's gone and downloaded an Apache Zookeeper targz file, extracted that, and I'll show that in a second, and installed that on the servers, and then started a systemd service that runs that Zookeeper. And we can actually also uh, uh, use the Kubernetes logs function. So if I, if I uh, want to look at the logs in Kubernetes, what the agent does is it talks to journal control, which is the systemd logging component on the machine, and extracts the log and streams that back to me on my management machine over here. So this is one of the instances where we have sort of the best of both worlds, because I can, in my Kubernetes UI, work with the logs and, and see from one central point everything that's going on. But I can also head out to the machine and do journal control minus u default zookeeper and see the logs uh, going on here. So you can see 77 oh no, yep, that's with the two hours UTC thingy that should be our current logs. So I can do it the old-fashioned ops way, but I can also do it the the way cool kids do it and use cube control logs. And then just to go for you one more example, uh, I'll also de uh, deploy a NiFi cluster because this shows um, our idea of sort of service composition. So NiFi in its cluster mode needs a zookeeper to orchestrate how, how the cluster nodes talk to each other. So in our spec here, we give it a zookeeper reference. And this is th this name, the symbol, is actually something that we'll recognize from over here. So if I now deploy this NiFi cluster, um, the operator will go out. It'll go talk to Kubernetes, ask for the Zookeeper cluster of name simple, and retrieve the Zookeeper connect string, and then use that to configure NiFi to find that Zookeeper and use that for, for its own orchestration. So we should now see, yep, here's a couple of, um, of NiFi pods that have been written out. 
th this is fairly quick because I did the de demo early on and the, the download has already been done. So um, usually this will take a little bit longer, but I figured no need for you to wait around for that. Uh, what we can now do is head over to Worker One Stackable Demo 10,000. As usual, forget the slash NiFi. And then you can see that we do have a NiFi deployed that should hopefully show us a canvas any second now. And up here, you can see uh, it actually did form a cluster of three nodes that's using the, the Zookeeper we deployed just before that to, to coordinate with each other. And with that, I believe I'm actually already one minute over time and we'll wrap it up. Thank you. Yeah.